broadcasting on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcasting Center. 90 Way Boston Street, yes, in the heart of the city we love, Providence, Rhode Island. The naked city, the city of 1,000 stories. We've told a few tonight, we'll continue to tell more. We are outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media. What does that mean? We discuss real issues, real people, real concerns, in a constructive, cooperative format, bridging the differences between progressives, libertarians, you know, mainstream Democrats, and even the occasional odd Republican. Just kidding, no. Um, so, our continuing commitment, of course, is to the city of Providence. It is the city we love. I personally have lived here for about 20 years, and my favorite place, as you've heard me say before, is, of course, Thayer Street. Thayer Street is truly, if there was a buffet in Rhode Island, it's Thayer Street. The, the, just a the sheer range and variety of, of stores and restaurants and cultural, uh, cultural meccas, um, you know, is it, just the Avon Theater, for example, just astonishing because it also reflects the lives and, and the intersection of two of Rhode Island's Seminole Colleges, of course, Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design. Downtown here is more of the J. Wu crowd. And of course, you get over to the West End, you've got Providence College and of course, Rick and all these other great schools across our state. But there's something unique about Thayer Street because of the international nature of the student population and what they draw from around the world into one little melting pot right there. Joining me for the first time is the latest entrepreneur to join the community over at Theater, Theater Street. Of course, I'm talking about Lana Nawa. Did I get that correct? Yes. Okay. And she is the president of an organization called Impact Everything. Um, starting off just a couple of short years ago, uh, a recent graduate, a chemistry graduate of the University of, of Connecticut, in addition to her partner. Soros Mandari. Thank you. Who is, I believe, a chemical engineering major? Civil engineer. Civil engineering major, okay. Um, joined together to provide really a unique online slash retail experience. Um, but we'll talk more about that and their connection not just to Thayer Street and to the internet retail marketplace, but their connection to the world in general. And as I said in the run-up to this segment, I think her effort really represents the future of retail. As we devolve away from the big bricks and mortar operations, what remains is distribution-based, intensive organizations like Amazon, who can certainly provide a variety of product. What they really can't provide, though, is a, a variety of experiences. And that's why specialty retail, I believe, is the future, because there's a variety of experiences that you can enjoy, even from your couch here in Cumberland or Johnston, just taking a quick ride into Thayer Street. Welcome to the Coalition for the first time. Oh, thank you. What a warm welcome. No, no, it's, I'm glad it's, to be here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great stuff. I spent some time uh, today on, on your website. A big thank you, of course, to Donna Personius, who uh, is involved with the, the variety of organizations that, that bring the Thayer Street Merchant uh, family together to work cooperatively and to, to work, I believe, in a kind of a unique free market way to, to continue to build Thayer Street as, as really a shopping mecca for Rhode Island. Um, but let, let's get to your story. You recently graduated the University of Connecticut. Yes. You were a science major. You were a chemistry major. That means you passed organic chemistry? I passed, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. That puts you ahead of 98% of the population. Uh, my daughter's university, they have something called Orgo Night. It's a longstanding tradition where the marching band and, and some ravelers and rabble rousers cavort around campus the night before the annual uh, semi-annual uh, organic chemistry exam no. just because of the death pall that sets across the campus when people... Um, organic chemistry is a course that changes lives, isn't it? Yes. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, so how did you get involved in, in this? Well, first of all, tell us about your site and what you can find on your site. Yeah, sure. So Impact Everything is basically... Dot org. Dot org, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Dot org is a store that's on a mission to change the world so mm -hmm. we basically sell everything from like clothing to household goods just everyday items and mm -hmm. everything makes an impact mm -hmm. the theme of the store we hit about 10 different causes it ranges from human trafficking education world hunger sanitation issues just basically the top 10 global issues and we try to tackle that through mm -hmm. the use of business mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting because it, again What's impressive about these model of new young businesses is you're going after product that is unique. You're going after product that would be typically called high end, but at the same time, you're building the community a step at a time, the worldwide community a step at a time, every time a transaction takes place. What was the, I always ask, 
um, entrepreneurs of, of any age what their eureka moment was. Well, you know, you and your partner are, <laughs> I mean, civil engineering and, and chemistry, that's, what, what, okay, I'm dating myself. Back in the day, we, we talked about government and history as being gut majors, gut being easy. Um, you certainly did not take the easy way out academically. So what was the moment that you decided you had this epiphany to, to, to do something like this? Um, it wasn't really like one moment. I would like to think it was more of a journey. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, Soros and I, uh, we attended the University of Connecticut, and we did have pretty hard majors, and we graduated, and we went to our respective fields. So I was a chemist, and he's still a civil engineer. But on the side, we did a lot of philanthropic work, right? A lot of, and we were also passionate about traveling, just like a lot of other millennials, just traveling mm -hmm. on our free time. And um, we just dipped our hands into a lot of nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically focused on the environment and human trafficking, and he focused on like engineers without borders and traveling and applying his major. And then over the years, we kind of helped each other out. And after a while, we had a good amount of experience of doing things under our own belt. So there was a huge earthquake in Nepal right. in 2015. And I think that was kind of the, tur the turning point. Not like, you know, mm -hmm. um, basically we decided, hey, like, we were really passionate um, people who wanted to make a difference. Like, let's just try to do something on our like on our own. Mm -hmm. um, so after the earthquake, and Soros was also born in Nepal. So he okay. came here when he was 14. He's very passionate about it. Because let me jump in for a second. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, a lot of the, uh, we'll call it the conventional Western economy that surrounded Nepal was obviously what we would call now adventure travel. But mm -hmm. it certainly left a, a, a pretty devastating environmental impact. Yes. On on okay. the the mountain ranges that you know that we most equate Nepal and adventure travel with. I mean, mm -hmm. the I mean, an, an astonishing astonishing amount of damage is done yeah. um, by by some. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to play class warfare here, but by by folks of means who parachute in, uh, use Nepal as their own personal statement on life, and then leave. <laughs> you know, yeah. and leave a lot behind them. It's 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 yes. it's, it's you know, and and you're in a part of the country, part of the world that's obviously very, um, uh, I'll call it uh, liberty impaired, liberty challenged. You've got mm -hmm. some fairly destructive governmental elements throughout that whole region. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So it, it's it's a difficult part of the world to begin with. The earthquake essentially reduced it to an and, and almost a medieval status almost overnight. It was highly destructive. Wasn't yeah, it, it was it was a, such a tragedy. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, and we just really wanted to do something about that and start there. Mm -hmm. um, and we just kind of came together like, what should we do? And he was a civil engineer, so he was like, I want to build something. Because mm -hmm. usually in terms of um, disaster relief, there's there's four different stages, right? And the, like medical, um, donating, and then there's the whole stage of after everybody right. leaves, which is reconstructing. Mm -hmm. So we figured we wanted to do something there. So we right. had came together and just raised money. We raised like ten thousand dollars in three months in mm -hmm. our community here in the U.S. in Brantford, Connecticut. Right. And then we just decided to fly over and give it a shot. And then we built a school. No, okay. Let's 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 take a couple of things. First of all, you, you're right to point out. I believe that the biggest challenge, um, and we've seen this in Houston and Miami and 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 um, and Puerto Rico in the last few months. Mm -hmm. The there is this enormous amount of attention paid to these areas. I call it tragedy porn myself. That's my words, not yours. Um, where the media is all too willing to, uh, you know, it's it's. And again, I hope you don't find this offensive. I've, with the ma major media's treatment of these tragedies, it's essentially clickbait with human yes. tragedy as as mm -hmm. the motivating goal. Unfortunately. Yeah. And so, you know, when was the last time? You know, if you listen to this show just a few short weeks ago, our friends at Dirk's Barbecue just down the street from your oh, new I digs, <laughs> yeah, they held a, uh, a fundraiser for Houston, uh, a hoedown for Houston. So when, you know, the, all of a sudden the next tragedy du jour happens and it seems like they happen at an exponentially increasing pace. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a, a whole community of people left behind who are, what about us? Uh, back help? Right. Uh, you have that. So I, I want to ask you about that, but I also, what's astonishing to me about millennials and people in my generation, uh, um, I have I have two daughters, one in college, one just graduated, um, so roughly in your your, your age group. Um, the What is it about your generation that is so fearless? I want to put this in the right perspective. You saw something, you're well-educated, you certainly had you know, you came from a, uh, one, one of the great state universities in our nation. Mm -hmm. You certainly had a career path laid in front of you that you could have easily followed. My generation would have just easily followed and given their $20 a paycheck to United Way. Your generation decides, you know what? 
I'm going to raise some money. I'm going to go over there and see what I can do. <laughs> you know, at the risk of oversimplifying it, wh how is it that your generation just just sees right through boundaries like that? I really think, and I can't speak for what's happened way before me, but I think specifically, and this is common to my group of friends too, is just we've we've we're very open minded because we've seen so much positive change just from will to do something, right? We've seen our first black president. We've seen gay marriage become a real thing, like mm -hmm. with real rights. You know, we've, and also traveling. My generation loves to travel a lot, and I feel mm -hmm. like when you travel, that really connects you to the other side of the world. And then you start thinking more things are possible. It's not just about my community. But what can I do on the other side? So all these factors, I think, just kind of motivate you to do more. You just have this kind of belief that, you know, like, why not? Like, what is there to lose? <laughs> well, and, and, and just a couple of weeks ago, we had a group uh, called Nakatelum, uh -huh. who uh, a bunch of Columbia grads got together and uh, uh, they, there was a, not a contest, but there was a challenge, an entrepreneurial challenge. And they said, they came up with the idea of why not, using Skype, have uh, Syrian, displaced Syrians give per, you know, for over a fee, give language lessons over Skype to people around the world. Awesome. And... What just not only was the idea great, but they just went out and reached out to the head of the UN displaced persons and refugee. Okay, just call them up, <laughs> you know. Just, <laughs> and then you know they just went over there and, and said something. And now a couple years later, you know you've got again fundamental change taking place because on the first level there's commerce, like you were doing. And then on the next level, it's not just the commerce, but it's the ongoing interaction with people of, of wildly different cultures, which breaks down barriers at an incredible rate. Yeah. And that's really the goal, isn't it? Right. And I mean, we've also grown up, and you kind of pinned that down, but like we've also grown up very connected because of, you know, the internet. We've right. just grown up with all the technology. So that sense of connectivity really does open up a lot more possibilities. Right. Yeah. And, you, and universities, the top universities are... It's interesting because there's a plus and minus this. If you're an American student challenging to get into the top universities, it's, it's very difficult now mm -hmm. because you're competing with students around the world yes, for, those, for those seats. I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but the unintended side effect of that is that, and let's look to Thayer Street. Mm -hmm. You've got students there. I mean, um, I've got family members who go to school there on Thayer Street, and you know their roommates aren't just, say, Indian or Malaysian, or uh, from one of the Balkan countries, from their heritage, mm -hmm. they just moved over from there. You're talking about students who a year ago lived in a different part of the world and grew up in a different part of the world. Mm -hmm. So the interrelationships that can happen, and again, the barriers that are broken uh, are, are just, it, it's like, I don't think it's like any other period in human history. Um, it, it's, you simply, again, I'm 30 or 40 years older than you, but, just 30 years ago, you know, the notion of just picking up and going to a different part of the world just simply didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It just, just didn't. So you started the website, um, and you've been in business for how long now on the website? A uh, year and a half, maybe mm -hmm. a little over, though, almost two years. Yeah. Right. So tell us about the, the products that you pick out. Now, you brought some stuff with us, but yeah, tell sure. us about the, the, the products that you pick out because... There is the goal, of course, is to be successful at commerce, but at the same time, you're looking at a range of products which make a statement of themselves. Fair statement? Right, yes. Okay. So tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So that was a very extensive process. Um, and we realized that when we had come back from Nepal, we were trying to, mm -hmm. we left, and then, you know, the money ran out. We built this school, and then we we're like, how are we going to sustain this? So we wanted to find sustainable products, which we bumped into. Um, this is how we started our own product line of hemp. So sustainability was a big factor. And then when we came back, we had this whole line, but then we wanted to partner with you know, other new businesses that had the same concept in mind to build the whole store. And what we really look for, honestly, is just transparency and that you're being very transparent about your impact. So there's different models. So there's this idea called social enterprise, which is if you can think about it, it's kind of like the traditional for-profit business and then you have the traditional nonprofit, and then you make a hybrid. So it's basically using business as a force for good. Mm -hmm. So your business has to give back. And people do this in various ways. This is only like a decade old, right. but the most common that we've seen um, initially was giving a cut of a proceeds to a nonprofit. So right. that was one way. So giving back um, a share of proceeds. Another way is one for one, which I really like because it's very, um, 
it's very visible, like the impact is it's very tangible. Visible. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tangible. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm say you buy one product like a t-shirt and then one t-shirt equivalent is donated to somebody in need um mm -hmm. so one for one exactly. it was a shoe company that really tom's yeah, right they they're like one of the founding fathers of right. social enterprise yes. right okay and and people right. were astonished by that i again yes. the, the thought process was, was just again so completely you know you use the term to, disruptor has become somewhat of a neuter term but truly they were a disruptive agent in, in, in really everything right. um so were your original products nepalese or were they from just uh, what what got going and and how did you how, also you know we all know how to use search engines and adwords and things like that but i i i'm a i started selling stuff on the internet in 19 let's just say uh, the last millennium. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, so it's not that easy. You know, you just, yeah. there's a, there's a popularized notion that, you know, you break class, add one or two kitschy products, have a cool website and bada boom. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not quite that easy, is it? No, it definitely isn't. And I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I'm pretty bad with all of that stuff. And I, I did this all myself, like built the entire website. This is like the fourth one right. after I'm just like fiddling around with it. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't really use search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. um, where we see our most growth is actually face-to-face -face sales, which is why it would let us to storefront. It's really um, a very, it's a business that's surrounded around trust and transparency. So mm -hmm. when we did pop-up shops, we did that for like a year. We made the most revenue off of that. Well, explain to our audience because that's a generational thing too. Oh, okay. Pop -up, uh, you know, yeah. because I, the only reason I am even remotely conversant with the real world is because I have two daughters in their twenties. Okay, <laughs> so uh, explain what a pop up shop is because that's that's yeah. a new phenomenon. That's kind of true. It's it's more popular now. A pop up shop is basically setting up a temporary shop um, for as little as like four hours to. Mm -hmm three days basically. Right. Yeah, it's just very temporary just to test the concept. Mm -hmm. You know, and we did that because we were a new business to see if people even cared about, mm -hmm. you know, things like this. Um, so we set up various pop-up shops throughout mostly the Northeast Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and just tested the concept. And we really found that, I feel like people were already there. They wanted to do good. You know, people all want to do good. They just need to be given the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, don't want, you know, huge big box brands to just take all their money and like blow it on things. Like mm -hmm. they, they inherently want to know their, their money does good. So it, the story it just spread like fire, honestly, because of our customers. And I think that's how we really grew. It's really word of mouth was the fastest. Um, our SEO and the Google AdWords is kind of non-existent right now. <laughs> we gotta get on that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, again, why, why, uh, why pay homage? You know, it, always remember that there's some another disruptor along the lines. There was a time when eBay was considered the center of the universe, and now is e what? I mean, you know, the, the same generation that uses MySpace uses eBay. Oh, MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing says quite sketchy like a millennial to a middle-aged guy saying MySpace. Um, <laughs> yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Um, who was the guy's name? Tom. Wasn't it Tom that you met from MySpace? The, uh, but, but um, so, and the pop-up thing, is to me, I, again, you know, uh, living vicariously through my children. You know, you, you go down to, into into Brooklyn, for example, and pop up restaurants, pop up theater companies, pop up. This can in any type of apartment or loft. You know, you're walking down the street now. You, you have no idea what's actually going on in that building. I mean, there's just it's it's everywhere. It is. You know, yeah. and oh, but the beauty of the one thing that independent media has in conjunction with with this type of commerce, only the strong survive. If you're good, you, you, you get to go back to work the next day. Yes. <laughs> if you're not, you go away quickly. So you've had, you've had for a year and a half, you've had significant staying power. Um, show us some, show us some of the products. This yeah, is, sure. Um, okay, so. And I'm, I'm intrigued, of course, as a libertarian, and I don't know if you caught our first segment, but um, as someone who believes to what's becoming almost a religious level, who believes in hemp, cannabis, and exactly. Um, so talk, talk to us about this. So this is our own product line of hemp products from Nepal. And um, this is from Darchula. It's a region where you can actually legally grow hemp. And um, so in Nepal, it's actually not legal to grow hemp or produce it like yeah. it is here, except for one region mm -hmm. named Darchula. And that's because the economy has been so dependent on it for generations and generations. Like if you took that away, like their village would just collapse right so because of that it's um they're still going so they hand me these backpacks and each backpack provides one day of education 
So it, we have like little tags on each one where you could measure your impact mm -hmm. and you know what it does. So it says right here, like this backpack provides eight hours of education in Dopa, Nepal. So this is like kind of the one for one model. So now where was this manufactured? Nepal. Okay. Yep. And we really wanted to choose something um, that helps their economy too. You know, we didn't want to just like, we're already working in Nepal and we wanted the people there to work on something that would sustain their own economy. That's why we chose to do international trade and as we do with a lot of other products now too, which is something really important. And so that they can still give back to their own children, their own community. Mm -hmm. um, I also have shoes in here. So this is the one for one model. Just do this here. And this is more, so what we try to do when we look at impact is we looked at our whole supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. From like, where can we make an impact? So that's kind of more like at the end, one mm -hmm. for one giving back. And there's also this athletic. So this is like focusing more on manufacturing design. Mm -hmm. And I really like these shoes. So these are from Germany. And they actually look like your classic Converse shoes. Right, I was gonna say. Yeah, like yeah. almost exactly the same, um, pretty much the same price, but they're ethically made, meaning the Cotton is organic cotton, mm -hmm. and it's certified fair trade, and the rubber is actually FSC certified, meaning that the the forest that it came from is managed responsibly, and it doesn't kill the wildlife there. Right. So, yeah, it's just like an ethical alternative, completely, you know, clean now, supply chain. Now, do organizations yeah. actually, are there, tell us, are there outside organizations that monitor this? Yes, yes. So? So... So the brand itself is Athletic, that's the shoe brand, but the ones that monitor, there's Fair Trade Certification right. and FSC, so that's the Forward Stewardship Council, and mm -hmm. they monitor it every year, and you have to write reports and show that you know, you're, you have a clean supply chain. So it's, it's kind of a rigorous process, um, but you know it came from a good place, so it's worth it. <laughs> right, so you said in the run-up, you had mentioned that you know, some of the issues that you felt personally involved with were uh, you know, fair labor, fair, mm. fair employment, human trafficking. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, as the marketplace, we vote with our wallet. Yes. You know, you true. you can, and and actually, I'm a libertarian. This this runs right up into my philosophy. Um, if we choose to source products ethically, mm -hmm. if we choose to ignore <clears throat> Walmart, um, if we choose to <laughs> do the right thing, then it happens organically. Yes. It, it, it's it's if if we expect someone to force Walmart to do it, mm -hmm. and yet continue to reward bad behavior mm -hmm. by our dollar, we have made a choice to continue the status quo. Mm -hmm. It's 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 really that simple. Right. And so one need not boycott. One need only, based on your own personal set of values, purchase from those organizations that not only make a superior product, but also the product in and of itself is built in a manner that is provides growth for all. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And that's kind of what inspired me to get into that. So I, I have shopped at Walmart, you know, mm -hmm. growing up. And after all of my volunteering experience and seeing like where my product come from, came from, I was really inspired to just like start buying from a clean supply chain. And it was actually surprisingly pretty difficult, at least where I lived, mm -hmm. um, to find a store that just had everything in it at, from a clean supply chain or made an impact. Um, mm -hmm. It was like you had to do your research on the internet and then like go find it on this website and that website or this store and that store. So that was kind of where the entire idea came from to make a store called Impact Everything where everything makes an impact so that it would just be easy, you know, like, because I do believe that people inherently do want to do good. They just need, you know, the choices and the tools to do it. Well, yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's it's a complicated world. And, and as cliched as that sounds, you know, folks, it isn't easy for folks. I mean, it, it's far easier to run out to the 7 by 24 Wally World than it is, uh, or the gigantic grocer, mm -hmm. than it is to go to, Let's say coffee, for example. Um, yes. <laughs> it's a lot easier to go to Dunkies, and I'm not disparaging Dunkin' Donuts, but it's a lot easier to go to a Dunkin' Donuts than it is, for example, an organization. You, do you drink coffee? Yes. Okay. Have you been to the coffee exchange yet? I haven't been there. Ah. All right. There's a place called the Coffee Exchange on Wickenden Street. They're not a sponsor of this show, I, um, <laughs> but I've been going there for 25-plus years, and as I like to say, they, they manage to embody in one building a spirit, a quality of product, and an ethos that Starbucks has spent billions and still can't get. Um, and they were, to their credit, back in the 90s, I keep referring back to the 90s, um, back in the 90s, they were involved in microloan programs to 
uh, fair trade, you know, fair trade really started in the coffee world uh, to mm -hmm. a large degree. And yes. they were one of the first in New England to get behind fair trade coffee and responsibly sourced coffee. So there, go there this weekend. I need to go there. Because it's actually, and it's also just a, a hell of a place because it's, it's, right, it's right at the intersection of Benefit and Wickenden, and that's where Brown and RISD communities come together. And um, mm. if you want a people watch, <laughs> well, they only let suburbanites like me in occasionally where, you know, I have to apply. A lot but, of interesting people around here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, so, okay, so, um, so these are available. Yes. Now, do you handle all the logistics? Are you are you inventorying this, or are you you, you mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you <laughs> are. Yeah. Just right. learning as we go. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, so we'll absolutely. have these as at our store, and yes, we'll also ship them online. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So we before we did do all the shipping ourselves, we had Amazon as our partner to help ship with online right. shipment. But now, yeah, it's just us. All right. So. Well, now, that, now that going from a an internet model to a bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's funny because most people would find that count counterintuitive, yes. but quite frankly, the 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 trend amongst the highest end retail is to to do what you've done. I mean, it's really it's 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 a very successful business model if if you're good. Um, the but it's a momentous decision. So of course you're from Yukon. You had your you're basing your um, your operation out of uh, out of you said the Brantford area uh, or, or Central Connecticut. Mm -hmm. What, what, I gotta ask you, what brought you to Rhode Island? What was it that Good got question. you here? Yeah, definitely. We have been shopping for a physical storefront location for probably like 10 months. Mm -hmm. And um, so first we did pop-up shops to test where our real demographic, popular demographic was. And it was right. definitely millennials, uh, college students. We did the best on college campuses. Mm -hmm. So we definitely wanted to open up next to university. And then it, we were looking at different um, locations throughout the Northeast, and then it actually came down between Yale University and Brown and RISD. Right. And, you know, at first I was shopping online, but then I eventually just came here for like a full 24 hours, right. and the vibe here was just so great. I feel like students here, and not only students, even like older generations that I've bumped into too, are very environmentally and socially aware and mm -hmm. motivated to make change, which is what our entire store is about. So I just felt right at home and that this really belonged here. So yeah. no, I, I've spent time on both streets, if mm -hmm. you will. And personally, I feel it's the, the RISD element that really turns up the volume on Ferris Street. You know, it's just, it's, a, it's you know, Yale and, and Brown are obviously world-class universities. Mm -hmm. They attract a diversity of students that's astonishing, a diversity of cultures, a diversity of academic pursuits. That's amazing. I always joke that, you know, kind of interesting sense of humor, but I always joke that if, if, if it wasn't for Brown and RISD, we'd be Bridgeport. Um, <laughs> you know, and think about it. That's the secret sauce in any of these communities you're talking about is the university community mm -hmm. because you bring in just, for example, just on its most superficial level, there are certain speakers who will, politicians, world figures, that will go to a Brown, that will go to a Yale, that will go to a Columbia, Harvard, any one of them, that simply you're not going to find in many other cities. Maybe a Stanford, an MIT, but you, you know what I'm saying. There's, yeah. there's an academic level that attracts um, its own peers. Mm -hmm. And that brings in a unique set of circumstances that you can't create. You, there's no, you can't artificially make it happen. It's true, yeah. You know, and, and it's that diversity that uh, and I know my conservative friends hate that term, but, but to be blunt, it's that diversity that makes Providence a very special city. It's a city of neighborhoods, and there's opportunity for people who can, who can deliver a unique product at a high level here. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very challenging environment in terms of the politics and the business costs of it, but, but now Thayer Street. Now, so you, you, you essentially fell in love with Thayer Street. Then. I fell in love with Thayer Street. I bumped into students from Brown, students from RISD, and they just, I, that was the answer. Right. <laughs> no. no, and and you know, and, and quite frankly too, it, it helps that you know uh, that brings a certain amount of I don't want to say wealth in the in the stratified sense, but there's an, there's an economy there that exists within that say ten square block area that's unique to that ten square block area. Mm -hmm. um, now you, you I, we met through Donna Personius, who uh, is with the TDMA, which is the Thayer, the Thayer Street District Merchants, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> But they were, I'm assuming they were pretty helpful. They were. Donna is amazing, yeah, definitely. And she's very eclectic and artsy herself. And mm. yeah, it just clicked. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. No. And where, where are you going to be on Thayer? You're going to. 
We're gonna be at 297, so that's right next to Supercuts, across from Blue State Coffee. Mm -hmm. Which, in, interestingly enough, was one of the first organizations in in Providence to embrace the you know the donation as a percentage of. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's great coffee, but they, you know, they they were one of the first really to, to embrace that. And, and interestingly enough, the restaurant model kind of lends itself a little bit more easily to it mm -hmm. um, than retail. Um, what other kind of products are, are you going to carry in the store? Um, yeah, sure. I have some other ones here. So we also have clothing. So I only want one piece of clothing for the winter. For example, like this is a dress. It's a sweater dress, very comfy. Mm -hmm. And this is a cool company, like similar to one for one model, but instead of an equivalent product, for every purchase you make, you pick up one pound of trash. And what I love about this is like, um, just like us, so we have a travel portion to what we do and we partner with other organizations to bring customers along and actually live out the impact. So mm -hmm. actually the people who pick up the trash are the customers. So you have like a trash day with your customers and you measure, measure how you pick it up from the ocean, you measure how many pounds of trash you've collected that day. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what they do. So this is called United by Blue. Um, and now where, where is this manufactured? This is manufactured in the U.S. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we have also U.S. manufacturers. A lot of our partners are actually in the West Coast, um, which mm -hmm. I, you know, I had originally gone there. Originally before Impact Everything, it was going to be more of just an eco-friendly based store because mm -hmm. I had gotten a lot of inspiration from San Francisco and the mm -hmm. West Coast right. and they're very environmentally friendly there. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, I found there was other models besides just being eco-friendly. But yes, yeah, so they are in the U.S. along with a lot of other partners. Mm -hmm. And so here's another, this is just a plain face hemp backpack we have. And more internationally, uh, we just partnered with Beyond Beanie. So Beyond Beanie, <laughs> yeah, just a classic beanie, fleece beanie. One beanie provides five meals to kids in need in Bolivia. And this is actually made from Bolivia. So they make it and then they ship it to California and then ship it here. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And this is super local. So this is called Headbands of Hope. And what it is is basically you buy a headband or like turban and mm -hmm. they also have other ones with like jewelry on it so one headband purchase provides one headband to a child with cancer and you donate it to your local hospital um, like right down the road you get to pick which hospital it goes to so yeah you got everything from all around the world as well as just in the hometown so wow that's outstanding yeah. <laughs> um folks if, if you're just joining us first of all let me talk about our sponsor for just a second airsciences.net uh, a locally owned business also very environmentally friendly um, mold remediation uh, intervention in micro microbiologicals um, provide a level of service if in fact someone in your family is physically challenged by um, by any of the issues surrounding the immune system uh, airsciences.net as we always say on the coalition we thank them for their support uh, Daryl Gould from Air Sciences will be joining us in the next week or two uh, for a segment to discuss what to do if you're if, if someone in your family becomes ill, what to do if you find mold or any one of the biological hazards that can happen. So again, what we try to do is skewer myths, but most importantly, in companies that support independent media through sponsorships, uh, and they're very affordable by the way, but sponsorships deserve your support because they're willing to support politically challenging content. They're not worried about boycotts, they're not worried about offending any people. What they are worried about is the community and they make a real investment in the community by by again supporting independent media. So airsciences.net based in the Bristol, Rhode Island area, but serving all over Rhode Island, well into Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, joining me in the studio for the first time is Lana Nawa. Now the website is impacteverything.org. Let's talk for the few minutes we have left about the travel side of it. Yeah, sure. So like a lot of other social enterprise models, like I said, it's like kind of a hybrid between for-profit traditional uh, certification and then incorporating a nonprofit. So there's Impact Everything, which is the retail front in which we collect proceeds through ethical sales. And then the travel portion is our nonprofit called Impact Travels. Mm -hmm. So after we came back from Nepal and built a school, we wanted to keep doing that and we wanted to take more people with us, like our customers, our mm -hmm. friends, our family. So the second part of the business is um, you can also travel with us to see the you know see the impact that your proceeds are making so you can come and build a school with us um and you can apply online it's impact travel so govontourism.org is the website and um, again we just use our proceeds to do that and whatever we 
don't make, we fundraise, usually with our customers. And we're going to Uganda in less than a week on the 9th. We're flying Uganda. Out. Yeah, we're going to try to build our second school. So we're really excited. We're pumped. Yeah. And then hopefully, so this is just the assessment trip because it's so short. We're like opening a store in a month. So we're just going to go assess the situation. It's really important to not just like go into a foreign country and say, hey, you need a school and like build one, but rather assess the need first. And right. so we're going to assess the land, assess the need, what type of school is needed if a school is really needed or maybe a technical school, maybe an all girls school, orphan school. We're not really sure. Mm -hmm. And then we come back, um, design the school, probably with some students here and then have people apply. And then we will actually have a trip next year where we construct it. And that's where Impact Travels comes in. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So when are you opening up? You're opening up in December. Yes. In time for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you can, folks, you don't have to go to the big box store. Um, don't. <laughs> there are plenty of opportunities on Thayer um, to really do some, uh, I'll call it carrying Christmas shopping. Uh, you know, you can find something at your store, which, you know, it, Years ago, when the nature of charities and charitable giving started to change, um, there were a number of national charities who did a very nice job of offering, in exchange for a present, offering, um, you know, to donate in someone's name. Well, that was kind of cool, but it also kind of stunk because that means you didn't get a present. <laughs> so so the, the point being here is you've got high-quality, responsibly sourced, really practical gifts to, that people can give, which is the same time you can include a card that says, oh, and by the way, you're, not only did I give you a cool dress, cool sneakers, you know, this, this, or this, it also accomplished this. So you're giving to someone on a, on a very personal basis, which means you're actually shopping for them, and you're actually spending, investing time in thinking about what you're getting for them. But at the same time, it also, I believe, conveys the true message of Christmas, which is charity. And, 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 and a gift of love. So not only for the person you're giving to, but for someone that you'll probably never even meet. And so when you talk about impacting people and changing lives, and impact is really the central message for you, um, what better way to do that? At, at, for literally, what will it cost you to go to the uh, old Air Force store, or whatever they call themselves this year, for God only built, stuff God only built by who, way, and mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's okay, I can make fun of them. I know you're polite, you're an adult. Um, I'm not. Um, so, you know, I mean, so ultimately, you know, you, it's really a triple threat. Buy at your store at Christmas, uh, you're supporting local business, you're supporting the local economy, and clearly in a state like Rhode Island, we need to do that. Um, we need to embrace the, the, the wealth of businesses that are not just on Thayer Street, but all over the state. And at the same time, take Christmas down a notch so that it's not just how sparkly and how crazy the gift is, but how nice would it be to get a gift from a store like this where obviously so much thought was involved, not only by the person buying the gift, by the person providing it. So there you go. How's that for her? Awesome. All right, it's cool. season for giving. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it absolutely is. So the website again? Impacteverything.org. Okay, and then the travel website? Go Voluntourism. Excellent. Um, and uh, you'll embrace in your trips people of all age groups? Yes, <laughs> yes, just apply. Anybody can apply. Even sketchy Peter Griffin lookalikes? Maybe not Peter Griffin. <laughs> that's me. Um, the, uh, no, that, that's wonderful. Um, I hope you'll you know, put us on your press list and, and certainly let us know the run-up for the grand opening. I have a feeling you'll have something special for that day, so please let us know when the grand opening is. Definitely will. Um, so that we can uh, help in whatever way we can. And you're right, Donna Personius is awesome. She is a force of nature, and she is transforming Thayer Street back into the engine that it once was years ago. She's really, uh, the, the it, to her, it seems like, it, to me, she's never said this, but I think she looks at Thayer Street like it's a, like it's a painting. And there's different parts of the painting. That, yeah. Yeah. And there's different it's parts of the painting. It's, it's a puzzle. It's 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 a sculpture. And it's but there's real people involved in real causes and just a lot of great stuff. You folks, you could spend a day on Thayer Street. You could start in the morning and literally, you know, go home at night, having had a couple of fantastic meals, done some serious shopping, catch an independent movie at the Avon. Um, had a cocktail at any one of a number of places, indoor or outdoors, go to stores like Be Good or Dirk's and have really, not just a lot of food, but really great food that's 
good for you, and responsibly starts. I mean, if, that's, if, if, if there's a theme that's arising from Thayer Street, it's that all these new independent efforts that have arisen there in the last two or three years um, all seem to have that as part of the theme. So, so I wish you nothing but the best of luck. Thank you so much. It was great being here. Thank you so much for coming on. Okay. <laughs> Folks, of course, I'm talking about Lana Dawa. She's the president of Impact Everything. Your partner's name again? Saroz Bandari. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's impacteverything.org. Where on Thayer Street? 297. 297. You're opening roughly the first week or so. First week of December. First week of December. Yeah. Plenty of time. So don't go out on, for the love of God, you know, spend Friday morning in bed. Hang out with your family if you're fortunate enough to have the day off. Just don't, yeah, really. Um, just just say no to to that type of shopping. And instead, pick out a Saturday or, 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 or a Sunday afternoon and spend the day on Thayer Street. Spend your money there. It stays local, helps great causes, and it changes lives. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> cool. Folks, we're going to take a very quick break right now. We've got a couple more folks joining us. It's 810. We've had... Two hours and 10 minutes of commercial-free programming ranging on everything from the medical cannabis movement, democratic national politics, uh, impact everything really responsibly sourced, intriguing product based here on the city we love, Thayer Street in Providence, Rhode Island. Joining us in the next little bit, we've got folks from the Goldwater Institute. Uh, we put out the signal again from Monique Chartier to join us. Uh, she's a taxpayer advocate, and as I like to say, the, the queen, the warrior princess of all the acronyms that matter. We are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center in the heart of the city we love, 90 Way Bosses Street. The Naked City, the city of 1,000 stories. We've told four or five already tonight, a couple more to go. CoalitionRadio.us, click on the YouTube page at the top of the page where these shows and others will live in perpetuity. Facebook.com slash the Coalition Radio. Please friend us, please. I know how to beg. And of course, on the mighty, mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio. And as always, our apolitical, all you billionaire baseball boys club, crony capitalist, wet Fenway dream, vanity play, taxpayer finance, anti-stadium website, Twitter feed, at Pawtucket is home. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs>